My name is George Ceseros, Chief of Huntington Park Police Department, and you're watching Facets Television. Welcome, I'm Kevin McDonald, and you're watching Facets Television. With me tonight is Chief George Cisneros. Chief Cisneros is with the Huntington Park Police Department. He was appointed in 2010, but he also comes from Long Beach Police Department with over 20 years of experience. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about his past experience and a little bit about what he does for Huntington Park PD. Thank you so much for coming in, Chief. I really appreciate it. No, thank you very much, Kevin. It's a great honor to be here on your show. So, um, let's understand a little bit about your past. You spent 20 years at Beach, and I know that you did a variety of different roles, so why don't you give us a little bit of a timeline on what, where you came from. Sure. Well, let me start off first. Uh, I'm a little bit different in the sense that uh, when I went to college, uh, my major was architecture, mm -hmm. and I started working in architecture back in the uh, late 80s, and doing that for a period of time, I, I got the calling, and therefore changed professions, and I got the great privilege uh, to work for the City of Long Beach and the Long Beach Police Department. Uh, during my career there, about 20 years, I got to do a lot of stuff, uh, a lot of great uh, career um, moves that uh, definitely helped me to where I am today. Such as, uh, obviously, every, every individual that starts has to start in patrol, that's operations. So we did that. Uh, we went to burglary as a detective. I went to homicide, where I spent about six years mm -hmm. in homicide. I was then promoted to sergeant. I then went into administration for the detective bureau and did all of the... Uh, all the administration work for the deputy chief then. Uh, after that, I went to internal affairs, okay. which is uh, two years, and we deal with all the issues with uh, complaints that come across our, our employees. From there, I was promoted to lieutenant, uh, did, went back to patrol, was a watch commander for a period of time. I then was given the great opportunity to start uh, the uh, uh, terrorism unit. Back in 2007, when the bombings occurred in London, mm -hmm. uh, I was fortunate enough to get on a plane uh, that day and arrived 12 hours later, spent about two weeks there, uh, wow. dealing with how they dealt with terrorism issues there and how they dealt and planned and how they investigated uh, the issues they had, the unfortunate issues. So, so I'm guessing that that, one, you come from architecture, which is a structured job and then you go into administration and then you so and you've had such a broad experience is that how you were able to get the chief's role because that's not an easy gig to get sure sure you know I, I'll tell you I was a chief of staff for four years and I worked for, for, for a chief that gave me a lot of latitude gave me a lot of power which gave me an understanding of how to manage a police department mm -hmm. and I think that really uh, opened my eyes as to what I really wanted to do which was my calling and uh, I wanted to be a chief, to be able to, to direct an organization in a, a certain direction and obviously dealing with uh, your employees uh, and making sure that, that they get the best uh, out, of, uh, out of their organization. And while law enforcement is paramilitary, it's also a bit like herding cats because these are all <laughs> aggressive, smart people and, and I, can, I can imagine it can be challenging. Well, times. we're all type A, right? right. Uh, and I think uh, everybody's heard that you know when there is an issue, a crime, everybody runs away from it. We actually run towards it. So we are a little bit different. And so, yes, it does take a certain individual, a certain supervisor to be able to, to deal with these individuals because they want to do uh, what's best for the community. I mean, it's a calling. Uh, we don't do it for the money. Right. Uh, don't get me wrong, obviously. We do have to make a living. Of course. But uh, we do it because it is a calling. So let's roll forward. 2010, you get appointed by the city council. Uh, and it was a, this wasn't just a reach into Long Beach. They did a nationwide search, did they not? That is correct. That is correct. So you go 2010, you get appointed, um, and then you did a short stint as the city manager? Yes. Uh, that must have been interesting. You know, that, uh, that period was about 11 months where I was doing dual jobs. So I was the police chief and the city manager uh, at that time. And that really opened up my eyes as to how to run a city. Now, don't get me wrong. Uh, just spending 11 months doesn't make me an expert, obviously, as a city manager, but I think it did open my eyes as far as what that position has to do. Uh, just from a perspective from a chief, you know, you think that that's all there is to, to government. Mm -hmm. and, but 
understanding the city manager position, understanding that there's parks and recs, libraries, uh, public works. Yeah. And, the budget and all, that has process they have to go through and all the planning. And, yes, you know, and the different funds sure. and how you fund all these different programs. And so that gave me a very good understanding, a better understanding of the finances uh, that are needed for to run a, a city. So I understand you're quite the technology guy um, yeah. and, and that coming to Huntington Park, part of the issue was they were in a bit of the dark ages to a certain degree. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about some of the advancement that you've brought to the department. Well, look, you know, you know, as a chief, you can never, you know, if somebody were to ask you, hey, uh, do you need more people? Absolutely. As a chief, I'm going to say, it. yeah, bring them on. Right. Unfortunately, you know, we, uh, the, f the fiscal issues that we're currently facing here, not only in my city, but in the state and across the country, those issues are, are extremely difficult right now. Imagine just the police chief, the, the department, uh, the head uh, individual in uh, public works, uh, or the department head in Parks and Rec, or the library, they're all looking for the same thing. So one of the things that I thought of is, is that we have to use technology to mo become more efficient, more effective, and fiscally responsible. Continue to provide that service to our community uh, the best that we can, but being a little bit more uh, effective in that sense. So we, uh, one of the very first things, and uh, I'm gonna shout out that name, and I'm the one that's carrying the gun, so you're not gonna be able to stop me that's on this. That's true. Um, and I wouldn't try either. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have a great uh, IT uh, private uh, company that works with us, which is Alvaca. Mm -hmm. And they, they, they came in and uh, we talked and, and they heard what I wanted to do. And, and they gave me direction. I'm not the IT person. I, I just have ideas and I need the individuals with the expertise to point me in that direction. So Alvaca told me, hey, your infrastructure is terrible. And so that was one of the very first things that we had to start with was our infrastructure. We continue to work on that. You know, we virtualized it. Uh, we got a sand in there. And so we, we've done some of the things and now we can go ahead and move forward with some of our technology. That's gonna make us more effective and more efficient. As an example, one is field-based reporting. You know, we're trying to get away from, from killing so many trees. Right. You know, so we are doing field-based reporting. It's all electronic. It gets approved electronically, and so we're moving forward with that. You also use, as I understand, field-based fingerprinting. You're also using license plate recognition, some really neat advanced technologies yes. that, one, help you as a police department, but also help make the community safer in general. Yeah, uh, automated license plate readers, which are, are these cameras that have the ability to read a license plate at a much faster pace than a human. Mm -hmm. So what people don't understand is before, back in my time, you know, as an old man, uh, when we got in a car, we had a computer in there. We would have to actually, you know, with a typewriter, put that, that uh, typewriter keyboard. Right. Uh, see, I, I am actually telling you my age here when I'm yeah. talking typewriter. It's all right. right. <laughs> I learned to do right. I will not say ain't anymore on a typewriter, right. so it's okay. So the, uh, the keyboard is, is how we used to put in license plates, and we would have to wait for a response back from DOJ. Right. Well, now the camera does it automatically, does it at a, a, a almost 100 times faster than, than a human does. And the field-based so, fingerprinting is the same way, right? You same way. Fingerprint them right there and get a report. Absolutely. Right the Absolutely. Game. So those things are helping. We're, we're actually using the automated license plate reader. We're going to actually take it to a next, next level, mm -hmm. which is we're going to use private uh, industry to assist us. And so it's a benefit for them. It's mm -hmm. also a benefit for us. So, so scoff law, which is parking tickets and those issues, um, they, they can be in, inputted into the system and we can capture those individuals who are not uh, paying their parking tickets. So you have a pretty intense concept of, of strong interreaction and in community policing. I'd like to hear a little bit first about your policing philosophy mm -hmm. and then um, a little bit about what, it's, what it takes and, and how you're moving forward the relationship with the predominantly Latino community that you work sure. in. Sure, that's a very good question. You know, there's many different policing styles, probably you know, policing, uh, inter you know, uh, fa uh, based, uh, data based uh, policing, and so forth. Um, what we, we do in Huntington Park Police Department is strategic policing. What that does is we're basically data driven mm -hmm. to understand our, our crime problem issues, but at the same time, we also take into account our resources. So we take into account our, our personnel issues, our tools, and our technology, and we try to best fit that resource into the problem that we have. But that's all embedded in community policing. Right. And, and we have to go back to that, that philosophy, which is working with your community, whether it's predominantly Latino or many, whatever it could be, mm -hmm. uh, you still have to work closely with your community. Um, it's the eyes and ears that most people say, and I say it's the eyes and ears and the heart. Mm -hmm. Because the heart is what calls the police department. Because it should be a demand from that community that they be able to walk safely at night, yeah. 
yeah. or that their kids be able to, to play on the street without uh, issues of violence. So it's the, it's the collaboration that we have with our community. It's when we, the synergy that we create mm -hmm. as a police department in our community that infuses that commitment. So having spoken to lieutenants and sergeants at the department, um, I do get the feeling, I mean, one of the comments I think that struck me, that struck me the, the strongest was, you cannot develop a relationship driving by. You have to stop, get out of the car, talk to people, Absolutely. To, you know, develop a, an actual interaction. And it seems so, it seems to me that your community policing isn't just a conversation, it's actually a commitment that, that drops down into the department. Right, so, so your relationship is really built by the men and women who provide that service to your community. So it's the individuals that uh, respond to those calls for service. Mm -hmm. So they have to be professional with integrity, and, and then you have to hold them accountable. So it, it really starts there. And I'll give you an example that happened to me many years ago. I was a very young officer, and uh, you know when I joined, I just wanted to put bad people in place, and that's my concept. That's all I knew at that time. And we had a chief back then who brought down a directive. Uh, down, you know, we're a paramilitary organization, so it came down the ranks, and so you will have and five. And it gets followed. Yeah, mm -hmm. you will have five positive contacts each day and you will record them. At that time, as a young individual, I did not understand the concept. I said, look, you pay me to put bad people in place. Right. Why are we doing this? And you know, it took, a few, it took a few years for me to understand what this chief was doing and I thought it was incredible. Mm -hmm. He understood that we needed that relationship with that community because if you're just a force that comes in and deals with issue and then pulls out like an army. Yeah, um, pushes them around in the process, right? Pushes them around in the process then, then you're really not a part of the fabric of that community. And as a chief, that's what I want. I want to be part of that fabric. I want them to understand that we're here to work with them to solve those issues. Working together, the police department by itself will not solve crime. Right. It so needs the assistance. So let's get to the point then on the, on the integration of the Latino community. I mean, that you have an additional challenge. You, one, have the issue of policing a community and supporting that role, but you also have the fact, I think in your community is what, 97 plus percent um, Latino and so there's the cultural challenge too how do you how do you bridge that gap well see that, that that's an interesting one because it's going to happen in any community in, in the city of Long Beach which was, was defined as the most diverse community in the country mm -hmm. we had those issues we had individuals from Cambodia we had obviously Latinos we had the gay and lesbian community mm -hmm. and so they, they all bring a different culture and so the only way that you can really deal with that is, is to integrate yourself into that right. and to give you an example as far as where we're at in Huntington Park Police Department you know we did a community uh, academy and it's a two-way street you know it's about us telling them what we can serve them but at the same time uh, we understand their issues and it's something that I brought from Long Beach. I did a, a community academy in Spanish in, in Long Beach. Mm -hmm. And I learned, you know, while I was giving them the tour about the SWAT gear, about all the things that we could provide, what was very interesting to me, and it's the same that I've had here in the city of Huntington Park, is, is that their main issue is traffic issues, yeah. parking issues. Yeah. Usually uh, lower income uh, areas uh, are obviously densely populated. Multi-family, small homes. Multi-family, right. small homes, mm -hmm. insufficient parking, that becomes a big issue. Yeah. And so you those get territorial are challenges and all kinds of issues, right? right? And, yeah. and so those are the things that um, you will not learn if you don't have a two-way communication. Right. And that's, that's the job of a police department, not to just be singular in one-way direction of communication. It's about also receiving information and listening to your community. Yeah, it's a difference between able to talking learn. with and talking to somebody. Absolutely. Right? I mean, frankly, that's, I don't know, that's a pretty yeah. fundamental thing. Yeah. Right? So uh, you've had a few years, um, if you're king for a day, and, and, and you are in your own way um, in your, of your department, but how do you see, where do you see yourself in, as an achievement in three years? I mean, where do you want, what do you want to have walked away with at the end of the next three years? Next three years. That's a very, that's a very good question. Look, right now, uh, you know, with the uh, relationship I have with my community, uh, and I can only say, I'm not saying me, myself personally, mm -hmm. I'm talking about my police department. Right. Uh, we have done a very good job with our relationship. Crime has come down in the last three years. Right. We've done this when we have uh, also at the same time reduced our cost. Mm -hmm. uh, this doesn't happen without the, the collaboration and the relationship that we have with our community. Yeah. So for the next three years, I want to continue that. I think that we can continue to do this and even do better stuff. You know, at the end of the day, I want to get myself out of a job. Right. That's kind of a kind of oxymoron, right? I mean, sure. but reality is, is that I want to reduce crime. Mm -hmm. and, and if that's really my model, that means that at some point, 
a, you know, there shouldn't be uh, a law enforcement component. Right. You know, right. but uh, unfortunately, uh, that's probably not going to be seen sometime in my lifetime. Right. But uh, if I was king, you know, there are things I would love to see uh, that I could fund, you know, intervention and, and prevention programs for youth. So from the community in, what's the biggest challenge that you have that the community could help you with? Well, you know, uh, like I said, I think we've done great strides in our communication and them calling us. I think we need additional uh, assistance with that. We, we received about 36,000 calls last year. That's a lot. Wow. And that's you know, if this you is think a city it, that's three and a half miles square. Right. We 60, calls we're about 65,000 uh, population, yeah. but we received 36,000 calls. Um, I think that we can continue to have that. We need that to get that better. Uh, I'm not, I'm not content with what we have. Right. It's a great stride. We're doing really well, but uh, as chief, I, I can't say that I'm, I'm at that place where I can say, you know what, we've done everything we can. Mm -hmm. We're a very good department. I want to be a great department. And I think uh, the people that I have are exceptional. I think it's my job, obviously, to empower them, mm -hmm. uh, to give them the tools to be able to do their job and to provide a, an environment where they can be innovative and at the end of the day, provide the best service we be can for the community. Team. It seems to me that the city manager and the city council supports you pretty well. I mean, I, I know that there's a lot of politics in a lot of cities, but I don't get the sense that there's much of that here. You know, uh, I can't take credit for that. I think uh, the men and women uh, that do the job have to take that credit. Mm -hmm. They've done a, an exceptional job uh, with the community, and obviously the community speaks to those they elect, and those that elect talk to, uh, to the individual that they have uh, given the powers to run the city. Right. I have a great uh, city manager who... Uh, who allows me to be innovative and so forth, uh, gives me guidance when needed, mm -hmm. and allows the freedom, you know, uh, as they say, allow the leash to, to allow me to do the things that I think are needed and necessary for this community. That's fantastic. So you um, had mentioned in a conversation we had um, that you're also working on a project that's completely independent of your current budget, which is a, a wireless mesh network. Yes. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, the city of Huntington Park, uh, probably many years ago, were one of the you know, leaders as far as technology was concerned. They, they had cameras on their main uh, street, Pacific, mm -hmm. and they had about 14 cameras, and uh, they did very well at that time. But that's been many, many years. It's passed, and these cameras have been breaking down. And so I looked for uh, a system that was, uh, and, I'll, and I'll preach it again, it's got to be efficient, effective, and, and fiscally responsible. I think my people are tired of that because every time they bring something to me, that's... Need that's an a, ROI, need an ROI. That, that's, <laughs> that's the three components. Don't bring right. anything if you haven't even really got the answer for that. So the wire mesh is a system, and, and to make it as easy as possible for, for everybody to understand, is basically like creating your own little Internet service area for, a, for a, mile, a square mile where I can move a camera in that mesh anywhere I can or anywhere I need to because of the crime issues. Mm -hmm. Now what we did was is we created two things, two frequencies. A 4.9 which is just basically a public safety, nothing else can go on that, mm -hmm. and a 2.4 which is a business mm -hmm. uh, frequency. The, the reason for that was is I knew that at some point these cameras have to be replaced. The maintenance has to be done. So when I put this in place and it's something that's going on now is we needed something that was able to to pay for the cost of replacing those cameras. And so I thought, hey, this would be the best way. So basically what I'm going to try to do is sell that business mm. portion. It's on the business corridor. Mm -hmm. And for whatever things such as, you know, if they want to do electronic parking meters or, or, or things of that, that nature that needs that Internet base. Right. And that way I can then make, uh, make sure that I can uh, pay for the maintenance and to renew the cameras, it will definitely be necessary sure. in another four or five years. Obviously, they're in, they're in the uh, obviously outside in the environment, and they and they're going to run out. Has has uh, government sequester budgeting changes from the federal government? Is, have you seen any negative impacts from that yet? Well, right now, you know, as the uh, as the vice president of LA County Chiefs, you know, one of the things that has happened is uh, the feds have now taken a, a, an additional ten percent for massive forfeiture. And so that, that, is, uh, that is an impact, um, but uh, you know, our job is to just continue to be creative w with the funds that we get. So we are Well, at working. least you'd already started on the road to physical responsibility, right? Absolutely, and, and, yeah. And you didn't have to try to cut to get to where you needed to get right. currently. So if folks wanted to learn a little bit more about you 
and the department? How would they get in touch with you? They can go on our website, which is www.huntingtonparkpd.org. Okay. Um, that's the best way. I think they'll, uh, all of our information, that's one of the technology things we brought forward is uh, we changed our, our uh, website. Uh, it's very easy and uh, accessible. So uh, I know that you really work to mentor and inspire people, and I understand that there's a young person in particular in your life that you had a pretty positive influence on that ultimately um, made a decision based on your help. Why don't you tell me a little bit about that? Sure, sure. So I was in the city of Long Beach. I was a police officer, and uh, I had a partner at that time. And that day, because we were the junior individuals, we had uh, been uh, given a ride-along, mm -hmm. a, a very a young man who was looking... Uh, and interested in, in law enforcement. And so he got into the car. And you know, uh, usually the ride alongs, you know, they'll go through the process, they'll see a few things. This gentleman got what we call the E ride. Yeah. You know, he got the E ticket ride that day. Uh, what happened was is that we had a, uh, we had a 211 uh, that had happened, which is a robbery in progress. Mm -hmm. And we were at a light, and uh, we were at this light when we saw a vehicle, and the description came over the air. Me and my partner looked at each other, and we said, oh my God, there's, there's the car. Yep. And the car saw us, and we saw them, and we were off in the races. And, uh, and he got we, the ride of his life. He got the ride of his life. We, we actually forgot about him in the back because <laughs> we were so entrenched into awesome. trying to capture this individual. And we, uh, we were on a major street, and he got onto the freeway. Uh, he couldn't make the turn and lost control and ran away. And, and so it, it was one of those uh, once-in-a-lifetime uh, <laughs> rides. And right. so... Yeah, about 10 years later, it was a kind of interesting. I was, uh, I was at that time, now I think a sergeant at that time, and we were just having a conversation, and there was an officer there. And this officer uh, said, do you remember the first time we met? And I have to be honest with you, I had not remembered. I was, See, at the time... Of your uniforms and badges going past Well, right? think yeah. about this. I mean, I was working in an agency where there was a thousand officers. Right, you know, right. So um, I was thinking, oh, my God, where did I meet this person? And, and it just wouldn't come to me. And he then said, uh, do you remember that 211 when you had a ride along? And I said, yes. He says, that was me. Oh, he says, awesome. I want you to know, uh, he said, it was because of that call that day that I decided I was going to become a police officer. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was kind of interesting. So you found yourself a commitment and uh, an adrenaline junkie. Clearly. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right. exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he got the... Uh, you got, definitely got the adrenaline. Well, that's neat. That, that's exciting. Well, thanks again for coming. I really appreciate no, it. No, no problem. Thanks Thank again. you, Kevin. Thank you. I'm Kevin McDonald. You've been watching Facets Television tonight, and with me has been Chief George Cisneros with Huntington Park PD. You can reach me at ionproductions.com, or you can write directly to crimetalkatjustice.com, and we hope you'll keep watching.